Good evening. How are you this evening? You're fine? I am looking at the clock and it's 8.20. And I was told that I have 15 minutes for every devotional. So, I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> if, we, if I go for 15 minutes, that means we'll leave out of here after 9 o'clock. Would that be okay with you? Um, you don't seem so confident with, uh, with your answer. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Yesterday, what was the title of the message? Sir, for some of you are not allowed to answer. I want PYC Picolamos to answer. What was the title for the sermon last night? And we discussed that in order to be enamored with Christ, we need to make sure that we take out of the way anything that keeps us from growing in our relationship with Jesus. Is that correct? We understood from the life of Paul that he found in his life that the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, his Lord, was the most important thing. So to be enamored with Christ, we need to have the same mindset to make sure that nothing gets in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Today I have entitled the message already and not yet. I would like you to turn to your neighbor and say already and not yet. Please do that right now. Please do it one more time like you have life. Let's pray. Father. I pray that as we discuss this idea, you will come. We are sinners and we desire to know more about you. We desire to be enamored with Christ. Please teach us how tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. We have been focusing our attention on Philippians chapter 3 and I want to do the same thing tonight and speak in our message from Philippians chapter 3 so if you have your Bibles I have it displayed on the screen but if you like to look at it in your Bibles please turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 actually I have three verses we are going to read from chapter 12 I mean verse 12 Verse 13 and verse 14. As our agreement, you're going to help me read. And what I want you to do is to read the highlighted part. Whatever is a different color, that is what I want you to read. The Bible says, Not as though I had already attained, either we are already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I consider not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had in his mind the idea of someone running a race. What did Paul have in mind? An idea of somebody doing what? We say in Filipino, tabo. Yeah? 
So Paul had in his mind an idea of someone running a race. Somebody who was top boy. I don't know if that's correct. But somebody was running. Maybe he was running from Santa Elena to another place. But this is the idea that Paul has in mind. And I want to highlight this as we, we study this, uh, this evening. So follow me. Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either we're already perfect, but I do what? When Paul says, I follow after the word, actually that he has in mind is someone running, chasing after something. And so for the apostle Paul, what is he is chasing is, to follow this, in, in the English Standard Version, the same verse, he puts it like this. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So for the Apostle Paul, he is running after a knowledge of Jesus Christ. We have understood from yesterday that the thing that Paul had in his heart, the thing that he wanted to gain the most, was the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Am I right? Am I correct? Paul considered everything lost to be able to gain Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying that I am running so that I can know Jesus for myself. As he has made me his own, I want to make him my own. So Paul says, I follow after. I run after. I am focusing on this thing. Let's look at this running language a little bit more. In verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are, and reaching forth unto those things which are. Now follow me. What Paul is saying is like this. As someone is in a race, going somewhere, or running towards something, the thing I am doing is that when I have covered a, a certain ground, like somebody who is running in a race, when I have run a certain amount, I no longer look back to what I have run, but I think about what I need to cover, the, the distance I need to get to. So Paul says, I don't think about what I have covered, but I think about what I need to cover. And Paul is thinking about someone who is running a race. When, they, when people are running a race, for example, in the Olympics, you know that they start from a particular place and they run reaching toward a particular destination of the finish line. Finish line. Are we together? But they never look back to say, oh, I have run that much. No, they say, I need to get there. So Paul is saying, I am running a folk with a focus in mind. I don't think about what I have achieved, but I'm thinking about what I need to achieve. I don't think about already. But I think about not yet. Let's understand this language a little bit more. In verse 14, Paul says, I, oh come on, you're getting dead on me. I, toward the mark, the of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, he repeats the same word as he repeated, in, as he wrote in verse 12. That word that he says, I follow after, he now changes to say, I press toward. In this sense, what Paul is saying is like this. I am running. I keep on running. I don't stop. Then when he says, for the mark, he is thinking about the finish line. I am running toward the finish, the finish line. And then when he says, for the prize of the high column of God in Christ Jesus, this is what he had in mind. In those times when you want a race, 
you waited for the judge. The judge usually was in a, in a, on an uplifted place like this. So the runner, the winner is down there. So the judge would now say, winner, come up and receive your prize. And so Paul is saying that I am waiting for the day when God is going to call me up and say, Paul, you have won the, 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 the race. Here is your prize. He does not tell us what the prize is, but he said that I'm looking forward to the day when I'm going to win something. And so follow me, my friends. Paul had this understanding, and this is the understanding that Paul had in mind, is that first and foremost, he understood that he had already gained some knowledge of who Jesus was. He had already attained to some understanding, but this is now the point that he makes, that he now understood that he had not yet fully gained a complete knowledge of Jesus Christ. He understood, I have done something, but there is something yet more to be done. So here is the point, my friends, as we study this evening. To be enamored with Christ Jesus means knowing the difference between already and This is my message tonight. To be enamored with Jesus, you and myself need to understand what is the difference between already and not yet. I believe not only does Paul want us to understand that we need to know the difference between already and not yet, but when he writes in, 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 in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, he makes very deep statements, which I want you to understand this evening. And if you understand what, I'm, what Paul is trying to say, as I will explain, I believe you can be enamored with Jesus Christ now and forevermore. That every day in your life, you can stay enamored with Jesus Christ. Every day in your life, you begin to understand that Jesus Christ indeed is the one I need and is the one that I am chasing and following after. You see, when Paul says, already and not yet, he's making the point that Jesus is inexhaustible. Jesus is inexhaustible. Do you know why the Philippines and China are fighting over Spratly Islands? Have you heard of that controversy between your own nation and China? It has been discovered that in the Spratly Island there is oil. So much so that it can supply a country for thousands of years. But let me tell you something. The oil in the Spratly is going to run out at some point. Things of this world, they're going to get exhausted at some point. Your bank account, after a while, can get exhausted. After you run a long time, you get exhausted. You can eat something and you get tired of it. I understand what I'm trying to say. But Jesus Christ is inexhaustible. Look at this. The Bible says, for in him dwell and all the Lord, all the Godhead, bodily. Jesus Christ is the full representation of who God is. When you look at Jesus, you have everything that God has to offer in him. You might not understand. Let me read another verse to you. The Bible says in Romans 11 verse 33, All the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, oh, how unsearchable are his judgments, and what? Oh, come on. How un unsearchable, how inexhaustible is Jesus Christ? His ways are past finding out. And now, this is why Paul is now saying, I have gained something. I know Jesus, but there is something more to know. I cannot exhaust Jesus. Therefore, every day, I need to continue running because there is more to know about him. What you know now 
is just but a fraction. What you know right now is but a fraction. You, you don't really know Jesus fully yet. And I like to say, you cannot fully know him. Not in this life. Isn't that great motivation to be enamored with Jesus? To know that, yes, I'm, I'm following someone who, he will, I can let it trust. There are new things to find out. You know, we are in relationships with people, uh, maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend, after you have been with them for a while, you can say, ah, I know this person. I know what they are like. I know what they like. I know what makes them angry. I know what makes them mad. And you can say, yeah, I have really figured this person out. But for Jesus, you cannot. There is more to learn and to grow. I want you to notice this deep quotation that I found in the book, Lift Him Up. L.L. White put these words. I want you to notice and how, how she writes. And please take note of the highlighted part. She writes, the mysteries of redemption, the blending of the divine and the human in Christ, his incarnation, sacrifice, mediation, will be sufficient to supply minds, amen, hearts, tongues, and pens with things for thought and expression for how? And time will not be sufficient to do that. The wonders of salvation. But through everlasting ages, oh, come on, Christ will be the sire and the song of the redeemed soul. New developments of the perfection and glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ will forever be unfolding. Even when we get to heaven that day, there is still more things to learn and to understand. How many songs have been written about Jesus? It's thousands. How many sermons are preached about Jesus? And they still preach it today. That's why I'm standing here because I am trying to find ways to say that Jesus is just too special. And after I finish today, somebody else needs to preach tomorrow. You're going to hear uh, Pastor Brian preach again tomorrow about Jesus. You're going to go and see about Jesus because you understand that I cannot exhaust Jesus. I cannot exhaust God. Isn't that great motivation to be in heaven with Christ? Isn't that great motivation? I believe there's something else Paul was trying to communicate as he used this running idea. And this idea, I believe, is he was trying to warn the people in those times about spiritual hazards. You know what a hazard is? Alam, 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 kayo? You know what, what I'm talking about? A hazard is something that is dangerous. And I believe that this is the danger that Paul was trying to point out, complacency. The idea that I don't need to do anymore. When he says, already I'm not yet, he's trying to say that you should never come to the place where you are satisfied with your current relationship with Jesus. You have not made it. You are not there. You know why relationships fail? One of the reasons is because we usually tend to become complacent. You have known her for some time. You have known him for some time. You stop texting him as much as you should because you say, anyway, he's always going to be there. So you become comfortable thinking and believing that there is nothing more to do. You have reached the plateau. And so understanding that Jesus is inexhaustible, Paul is saying you should never be complacent because there is more to learn and to discover. So Paul, I believe, was trying to warn the people that they do not need to be complacent. I, I found another quotation that is so powerful. And I want to dwell a little bit on this one. 
She writes in the book, First Selected Messages, many are looking with self-complacency upon, please, 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 follow what I'm, what I'm reading. Many are looking with self-complacency upon the years during which they have advocated the truth. They now feel that they have, they are entitled to a reward for their trials and obedience. Their faithfulness for the year will never atone for the neglect of the year. A man's truthfulness yesterday will not atone for his falsehood today. You see, this is how we get complacent many times. And especially for those who have been in church work for a long time. This applies to them. You feel like you have served the Lord for so long, now you can relax. And you can say, Lord, you know what I've been doing for you over the last 30 years or 50 years. I've served you faithfully. Now, give me a break. I can relax. Or you can say, Lord, you know, yesterday I served you. I, I went to church, you know. I went out for outreach, you know. Please give me a break. Uh, let me just relax now. Lord, you understand I was at PYCB home. I spent four days there. Give me a break now. You, you know what I did for you? Are we together? So we tell the Lord, Lord, I deserve something for what I'm doing for you. And so complacency, my friends, is so dangerous because it makes us believe and think that we have made it. That we are entitled to something. I wish I had more time to, to break this thing down and, and go a little bit deeper. But I want us to understand that for Christ, for God, for Jesus, it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. What matters is what you're doing right here, right now. Do you know why Moses did not go into the promised land? This great leader of God wrote to us the first five books of the Bible. He just said, Lord, for once, let me just tell these people that they are, they are rebellious towards you. And the Lord says, you are not going into the promised land. I'm not saying that he was complacent, but I, I believe that he, he, in his mind, he, he thought that the Lord can excuse, excuse his mistake. And so many times, this is how we think. That the Lord is going to excuse what I have done. And so I believe that Paul was trying to warn the people that, no, do not get complacent. Do, do not get comfortable. There is more. The third point that I believe that Paul was trying to bring out as he's using this running imagery is that this life is full of trials and temptations. Do you agree with me? How many of us don't face temptations? We face many, right? Now think about this. Think about this. When you are running a race, you're going somewhere, the temptation is to what? To do what? 